If you want, please open your Bibles with me in the book of Acts this morning, Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 as we excitingly start a new series on Acts chapters 9 through 12 that we're calling Unstoppable Advancing the Gospel One Opportunity at a Time. My name is Matt Brooks. I'm the senior pastor here at First Baptist Church, Broken Arrow. I want to remind you that our creative team has put together a devotional that walks right alongside the sermon you're about to hear from me in Acts chapter 9. If you're interested in that this week, as you continue to follow Jesus, text the word sermon to 4577. Six, I want to talk to you this morning about the effects that movement has on your life. Uh, To me, one of the most amazing things about going to the ocean is not just seeing the grandeur or the expanse of this body of water that is endless, but it's also the amazing consistency of the waves. Each in every day, no matter what time of day, no matter where you are, they're always coming over and over and over again. It, It doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing, they're coming. That's exactly what the gospel is doing in Acts chapters 9 through 12. That God's people are going to take an intentionality among themselves. They will do whatever God asks them to do, and they will share the gospel with whoever God asks them to do. And the world has never been the same since. May God do such a work in and through us. You know, the the Bible reminds us that that God links both our body and our mind and our heart. And studies have demonstrated this truth. In fact, I read an article this week from the Harvard Medical Journal that, that was linking the effects of physical health on mental health. That the more that you intentionally move, that the more you proactively each and every day have a way of life of doing something physically, it actually increases your capacity mentally in two ways. Number one, it reduces anxiety and depression. It also enhances proteins in your minds that fuel your nerve fibers, which help with cognition or critical thinking. The more you move, the more clearer you'll think. Well, what can't God do through us then spiritually if we have this mindset? That whatever God is asking us to do and whoever we desire to share the gospel with, God moves through faith. And that's exactly what I want to talk to you about today from Acts chapter 9, verses 32 through 43. We got to get moving. Tragically, most people don't. In fact, someone said it well when he said, some people make things happen. Other people watch as things happen. Most people don't even know what happened, right? May it not be said of us. May there be an intentionality among us to be sensitive to what the Spirit is leading in us. To do whatever it is he's asking us to do, to share with whoever he's asking us to share. Let's get moving. Now, when we come to Acts chapter 9, a lot has happened. We have arguably the greatest conversion in the history of the world in Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapters 9, verses 1 through 31. Overwhelmingly, it is not just the display of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. We serve a God who is alive, not dead. But it is also the faith of God's people. A man by the name of Ananias that ministers to Saul in this critical season of ministry that sets the trajectory for the Apostle Paul being the greatest missionary, the greatest theologian, the greatest disciple maker the world has ever known. Overwhelmingly up until this point of the book of Acts, Acts has been dominated by a man by the name of Peter. Peter, who is the unquestioned leader of the disciples during Jesus' earthly ministry, is now the leading apostle. And he ventures outside of Jerusalem and heads to Judea, specifically the region of Caesarea, which is filled with such bulging metropolises as such as Lydda and Joppa, okay? 25 25 miles northwest of Jerusalem. And you will find Peter's everyday faith. You will find Peter's ability to discern what it is the Lord is asking him to do that will set the stage for two of the most incredible miracles in Judea and Samaria, and we're going to study them this morning. You see, previously, Peter has preached the gospel to thousands in Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 41. But now his ministry is going to center on individuals, and God's gospel is going to change their lives, and those around them in the world has never been the same since. Let's get moving. Let me show you what this looks like. Let me introduce this story in verse 32 and 33, and then let's see what does through a man by the name of Ananias and a lady by the name of Tabitha or Dorcas in the following verses. With that in mind, look at verse 32. 
Now as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. Now, we've not heard from Peter since Acts chapter 8, verse 25. And though his ministry is not publicly noted, it was privately thriving. You see, Peter took the command of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 28. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Seriously. And now, literally, he is going from Jerusalem throughout this region in Judea and Samaria and just going and preaching and ministering and visiting whoever it is the Lord has given him in Jesus' name. You see, God moves when his people are moving. Oftentimes, God's richest ministries are reserved for God's most active saints. So get moving. Have you seen this within your own life? That God often moves within a movement. That God is already at work. And so you taking an intentionality, you being open to whatever and whoever the Lord says go share the gospel with, in Jesus' name, God tends to bless that work. Is there an intentionality on our part to move where God is? is working. Would you say that is true of your life? Would you say it's true of your life that there's an intentionality to be involved in what the Holy Spirit is doing? You say, well, what does that look like? Well, can I tell you that we're here to help? You know, it's our desire to reach me and beyond by multiplying disciples to follow Jesus. We want to make disciples and make disciples that follow Jesus. That's our mission. But we've also detailed a path an intentionality of steps toward a movement to fulfill our mission. And so we want you to engage in worship as a way of life. We want you to be in a group as a way of life. We want you to invest in a few as a way of life. We want you to give it away as most of these disciples in the book of Acts did as a way of life. But we also want you to make an impact. Now, primarily, we set that up through Next Steps 101 and Next Steps 201. Next Steps 101, which is the next meeting, and is June the 4th. You can sign up for this right after our church services. It's a wonderful place where you'll hear our mission and vision. You'll hear this path that I just outlined in more clarity. You're going to meet our staff. But there will also be an opportunity where our Next Steps team will come alongside and begin a conversation in this journey of what God is moving in your life. And you will begin through this journey, through this place assessment, to in Next Steps 201, know who you are, what are your passions, and how specifically God can use those to fulfill the mission he's given his church. I can't think of a better time than right now to move where God is moving. So where is he moving you? We would love to have that conversation. Let's get moving. Peter did, and look who we found in verse 33. There he found a man named Ananias, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. Now Peter's in Lydda, and he finds a man named Ananias, who was paralyzed or immobilized for eight years, more than likely as a result of a stroke or some abnormality. Ananias, in my opinion, is a Christ follower. He had heard of the gospel work through God's people in Jerusalem. God's people, who we don't even know about, were faithfully sharing this gospel from the region of Jerusalem to now the coastal regions where Lydda is. This man heard the gospel. This man, even though he had a physical ailment, God had already taken care of the spiritual ailment. That though this man was immobilized, paralyzed for eight years, 96 months, 2,920 days. It is well with his soul on the inside. And it's within this synergy of these tensions that this man is struggling, that this man is dealing with suffering and social restrictions and hygienic difficulties and even emotional distress or depression due to this illness. But yet God is going to use this man. God is going to take a man that the world saw as useless And God is through Christ going to make him useful. He can do the same with you. That God can take our pain, our suffering. That God can take our frustrations. 
God can take these things that we're working through, what seem as miserable, and can use it to display his miracles for his glory. God had a purpose for Ananias. There was a purpose for this illness. And it's all of these things that you and I celebrate in the gospel. It is all of these things that you and I celebrate that the greater miracle has already been cured through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That regardless of what's going on outside of us, the greatest miracle is on the inside. And that God has saved and transformed our hearts. And it's this assurance of this gospel that dominates this narrative. That it is only through Christ do bad things turn out good, God things always last, And the best things are yet to come. Can you be assured of this truth? That whatever it is in our lives that are miserable, God could set the stage for a miracle. That God by his grace can turn bad things into good. That God then blesses us with God things that will always last, that will always persevere in our sanctification unto the Lord. And for a Christian, for a Christ follower, the best is yet to come. Take heart, O church. We are one day closer to glory. We are one day closer to seeing our king. We are one day closer to no pain, no shame, no distress, no anything else that does not glorify the Lord, but all things will be made new in him. Paul tells the church of Rome in Romans 8, verse 28, for I have learned that all things are for my good then and God's glory. God is going to take Ananias. And through Peter, he's literally going to be the third person that is immediately healed by Jesus Christ himself in the book of Acts. Look at verse 34. And Peter said to him, Ananias, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose. Now notice Peter didn't ignore this man. Peter didn't reject this man like others. No, Peter engages this man and he identifies his malady. And the order of words is very significant here. It is transformingly Jesus the Christ is at this very moment healing you. That Ananias tells this man that Jesus Christ himself is completely healing this man. Not Peter. Why? You see, Peter wanted to make sure that there were no confusion. That this power did not come from Peter. That this power came from the Lord through Peter. You see, Peter didn't want Ananias or anybody else following Peter. He wanted this man to continue to follow Christ. In fact, did you notice that Peter immediately tells this man to do something after he's healed? He tells him, arise, get up. Spread your bed. Prepare your table, literally in the original languages. The impetus is, get going. Do what you do. As a way of life, be active. True faith is always like that. True faith always obeys and is always active. True faith moves. You see, few of us have the physical paralysis of this man But so many of us struggle with the spiritual paralysis. So many of us are stuck in our ways and we're wondering why God is not moving freshly in our lives. It's because we're not open to an intentionality to move. It is because we are stuck in ourselves, stuck in our shortcomings, stuck in our frustrations. God says, move, arise, get going. Don't focus on your problems. Focus on his son. So many of us are scared to what's next. We have this uncertain future. I mean, our economy is crumbling. Our currency is dissipating. Our world's about to be at war. We're fearful. We've got to remind ourselves of a God who says 365 times in the Bible, one for every day of the year, do not be afraid. Or to remind ourselves of God's word and his promises. Or to move. Because we are people by faith. 
not by sight. Get going, Ananias. Arise. Move. Because you are healed. God desires today to do the same through us. God wants you obedient to what he has for you today. So what is it that God's putting on your heart where he's saying move? Who is it that God has placed in your heart that he's saying move toward them? Show Jesus to them. Because this physical miracle had a spiritual result as well. Look at verse 35. And all of the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. I mean, they see the results of this miracle. This man who had been paralysis for eight years now walks, now is healed. And widespread repentance and revival occur. You see, they went to this man and said, what in the world happened to you? He didn't describe to them the what. He pointed to them to who? Peter came. And Peter said, the Lord Jesus healed me. And I was healed. Who is it in your life that needs such truth? Who is it in your life that needs to be reminded of what true faith is by what true faith does? Who is it that needs such truth? Now, here's something fascinating. In the grand picture of God's providence, the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 35, verses 1 through 2, 700 years before this miracle, had already prophesied that this would happen. The prophet says in Isaiah 35, 1 through 2, for the wilderness and dry land of Sharon shall be made glad, for the desert place will bloom, for they shall see the glory of the Lord, for they shall behold his majesty. It was the power of Christ through Peter that powerfully moved in and through this community. And the worlds were never the same. And can I tell you, our God desires to do the same right now, right here. That God is asking, are you ready? Are you available? What is it? Who is it? Move. You see, fruitfulness for God is related to faithfulness to God. God is abundantly able to do more than we can ask or think. He's powerfully willing. Are his people to move to what God asks us to do? to be obedient to whoever it is he's leading us to. God did all of these things through Peter. Not for Peter's glory, but for God's glory. And this community was never the same. Now secondly, Luke introduces us to a miracle in Joppa. Look at verses 36 and following. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. And in those days, she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Now, Luke quickly transitions to another region in Judea, the town of Joppa, which is about 10 miles from Lydda. Now, interesting enough, the word Joppa means beautiful. You ever been in a place where they just thought, this is the most beautiful place in the world? And you're kind of saying to yourself, ah. I don't know about that. Brent and I, in 20 years of ministry, we've had the privilege of doing ministry all over the country. So from California to New England to Florida. We've also, by God's grace, we've, we've done ministry. We've pastored in five states. So we've been to Alabama and Mississippi and Texas and now the great state of Oklahoma. But we spent five years of our life in ministry in New Mexico. Now, please hear me. New Mexico is one of the most randomly beautiful states in our entire country. You need to go. You need to check out this place. I mean, Angel Fire, Eagle's Nest, Taos, Santa Fe, full of history and culture, Mexican food is what I'm talking about. It's just awesome. But God placed us for five years in the desert. Three and a half hours everywhere you went, 
of desert in Roswell, New Mexico. And for those of you who've never been to the desert, let me aptly summarize the topography of a desert. No matter where you look, no matter what time of day, you ready? Dirt, rocks, and cactus. That's about it. He said, well, wait a minute, what if you go an hour to the north? Dirt, rocks, and cactus. Well, wait a minute, what if you go an hour the other way? Well, actually, that would be the same place that you were previously, but it's still dirt, rock, and, and what? Cactus. And so one day I went out fishing with one of our deacons and we went three and a half hours to a lake. It was awesome, but just like everything else, it was three and a half hours from Roswell. So we're driving three and a half hours there. We catch a ton of fish that day on this lake. We're on our way back. So for you math majors, we've been in a car now for like seven hours and we're headed through the Pecos Valley into the desert. And this deacon looks at me and says, Pastor, isn't this just beautiful? And so I looked at him and looked out my window. I looked at him and looked out my window and I told him, no, no, it's not. There's just dirt, rocks, and cactus. It is a very ordinary place, but be encouraged because God can do extraordinary things in ordinary places. You see, many of you, you may be like me most of the time, and you may be in an ordinary season of ministry, an ordinary season of your life. You're just being faithful to the everyday ordinary things. Do not ever forsake what God can do with the ordinary. Do not ever forsake what God can do by your faithful prayers daily by faith until they become sight. Do never forsake what God can do ordinarily through you just coming to his word and saying, fill me, renew my mind, empower me for your glory. God can do extraordinary things. Do never forsake the ordinary things that God can do with you just faithfully sharing and showing the gospel to those around you. Someone's life may be changed forever. And that is exactly what happens in Joppa. Though the word Joppa means beautiful, archaeologists tell us it was a very ordinary place. It was a seaport town that people got in and couldn't wait to get out. But God can move extraordinary in this ordinary place. And we're going to find here one of the most extraordinary Christ followers in the entire New Testament, a woman by the name of Tabitha. Now, she also went by Dorcas, but you know what? We just, for the, for the sake of time here, we're just going to call her Tabitha. I mean, I've been in 20 years of ministry now. I've seen hundreds of babies, possibly you know, thousands of babies that we've dedicated to the Lord throughout the years, have never dedicated a Dorcas to the Lord, right? It's just it's a very interesting name. But it means here, Tabitha does, gazelle. And it tells you everything in Christ you need to know about this woman. You ever studied a gazelle? They're one of the most fascinating animals in the animal kingdom. Unlike almost any other animal, they have this ability for dynamic acceleration instantly. Fused with, are you ready for this? A diligent, zealous focus. They're always on watch. They're hardly ever caught by surprise. And if they do, they're dead. So God has given them this intrinsic ability to always stay on point, to never lose focus, to not be distracted by what's going on on the outside. And then when they move on the inside, instant speed, dynamic acceleration. That is Tabitha. Here's the amazing thing. One of the wisest men in the entire Bible, a man by the name of Solomon, said in Proverbs 6, four through five, that you and I are have this disposition of a gazelle, that we're not to give our eyes to slumber. We're not to close our eyelids, he says, but we're to save ourselves like the gazelle who makes way quickly. That's Tabitha. Tabitha, as a way of life, was zealously focused on what God had asked her to do. 
She then, as a way of life, apparently, dynamically accelerated in obedience to whatever and whoever God asked her to share Jesus with. In fact, the Bible says in verse 39 that apparently she had a spirit-filled work among widows in the region. The Tabitha, being beloved and charitable and dynamic as a Christ follower, are you ready for this? Is the model church member in the book of Acts. You want to know what it's like to be a Christ follower? You want to know what it looks like to faithfully live on mission for Christ? See Tabitha. And tragically, Tabitha becomes ill and dies in verse 37. Consequently, Tabitha is washed and she's anointed and she's prepared for burial. Not what was customary in the main living room of her house. For the Bible says in the upper room. Now this is fascinating. You see, according to verses 38 and 39, the disciples of Joppa knew that Peter was in Lydda. And knowing of his prominence and his reputation of one who could heal, they sent men to Lydda to bring Peter to Joppa. So perhaps as an expression of faith, these men did not prepare Tabitha's body traditionally, but they prepared her in an upper room to perhaps set the stage for Peter to raise her from the dead. In doing so, look at verses 40 through 42. But Peter then put them all aside and knelt down and prayed and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up and he gave her his hand and she raised her hand up, or he raised her up, and then calling the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all of Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Now see this scene. Peter's 10 miles away in Lydda. Tabitha, Zill would ultimately die. Men are sent to Lydda to bring Peter to Joppa. Peter shows up to this house. He didn't know these people. He didn't know the situation. And he's brought to this upper room of overwhelmingly, more than likely, a very large house. And the first thing that Peter does is send everybody out. Out. Get them out. And he kneels. And he prays. And he intercedes to the Lord, petitioning him by his grace to heal Tabitha. What is he doing here? I'll tell you what he's doing. First of all, Peter does this to make no mistake that the glory of this miracle would not go to Peter, but it would go to the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody out. The only explanation of this is that the Lord moved. Peter was consumed not with his own glory, but with Christ's glory. Number two, almost this exact miracle takes place in Mark chapter 5, verse 41. And Peter either witnessed this miracle or had conversed with the Lord about this miracle because Peter uses almost the exact phrase that Jesus used in the miracle in Mark chapter 5, verse 41. Thirdly, I believe Peter, as a way of life, is stressing to all of those who would heal of this, or hear of this miracle that they are solely to depend upon the Lord that our power rests in the Lord, that our capacity rests in our willingness to be open to receive what it is God has for us. And all of this sets the stage for this amazing miracle. See, prayer precedes his power. 25 separate times in the book of Acts. God's people are gonna gather together they're going to pray and talk to the Lord. And they're going to ask for his power. And ask for the willingness to obey what it is he's asking him to do. And then God is going to bless God's people. This same life-changing power is available to us by faith. If we'll pray. Prayer precedes his power. You say, I want this power in my life. Well, then follow the example of Peter. Peter. Start this season with prayer. I mean, have you even asked the Lord for his help? Whatever it is you're going through, whatever this is upcoming in your schedules, whatever it is you can't stop thinking about, are you asking God for his power? 
Are you asking God for his wisdom? Are you begging God for discernment through this? Start with prayer. Secondly then, talk to the Lord. Allow this prayer to lead to his word. And through your engagement of God's word, it's never to be a monologue, but a dialogue. And as he talks to you, you talk to him. That's what Peter does. He's petitioning, interceding to the Lord. Thirdly, then pray for spirit-led obedience and impact. And then just by faith, see what God does. Peter does these things and immediately Tabitha's eyes are open. She stands up, begins to re-engage in her ministry there at Joppa. And the news of God's resurrection work and power began to spread throughout the entire region. So much so that the Bible says in verse 42 that throughout all of the region of Joppa, many believed in the Lord. I can't help but think that as God moved mightily in this coastal region, that God still desires to move the same among us. Did you notice that the foundation for this miracle was obedience and faith? Whatever, Lord, you're asking me to do and whoever, Lord. And lives were changed and the world has never been the same. You see, you never know how your faithfulness today could impact someone's life tomorrow. You have no idea the impact that you could have through your faithful prayers through you diligently showing and sharing the gospel each and every day and how God can use that as a catalyst for life change for his glory. Peter was just simply living intentionally, being open to what it was God had asked him to do. He didn't know these people. All he knew is that they needed a savior and that the same Christ that saved Peter could save them. And whatever it is that God asked Peter to do, he did it. Whoever it is that God asked Peter to share the gospel with, he did. And revival broke out in this region. Oh, may God do the same with us if we just get moving. Now, before we close, there's an interesting transition that really stands as a bridge between Acts chapter 9 In Acts chapter 10, next week, we're going to study one of the most dynamic conversions in the entire Bible. A man by the name of Cornelius is going to accept Christ in Acts 10. Don't miss it. But before we get there to that significant passage, there's something here that appears in verse 43, insignificant. But no, it sets the stage for the entire rest of the book of Acts. Look at verse 43. And he stays in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. So Peter, he's going through the coastal regions. He's been to Lydda. He's been 10 miles from there in Joppa. People are accepting Christ. People are open to the gospel. He decides to stay. Peter was a Jew. And as a Jew, he would have been reared in a strong tradition of prejudice that went clear back all the way to Abraham in Genesis 15. So much so that historically, Jewish midwives were forbidden to aid a Gentile woman during childbirth. You want to know why? To prevent the spreading of Gentiles. Furthermore, at the time of Acts, faithful Jews would often spit contemptly while even saying the word Gentile. Yet here, after all of these miracles, Peter stays with Simon, a Gentile. He stays with a man who has a profession, was a tanner. You say, well, what does that mean? As a tanner, this man would have been deemed unclean because he dealt with the carcasses of dead animals every day, a practice that was prohibited by Jews in the Mosaic law. Additionally, this man lived outside of Joppa. He would have lived by the sea because he needed seawater to tan the hides. So he was an outcast. He was an out. Cider. He wasn't part of the crowd. He wasn't someone who was in the club. He didn't know the handshakes and the mojo and everything else. No, this man was hanging out. Was an outcast of society. Was an outsider. Yet Peter 
stays with this man. Why? A couple of things. This man living by the seaside and working daily by the seaside was more than likely, by necessity, also a fisherman. He would have to catch fish to live, would he not? And so as Peter, formerly a fisherman, began to connect with this man, and would you know it, knowing Peter, it wasn't time, that, too much time that went by before they stopped talking about being fishermen and how Jesus had called them to be fishers of men. It is also most likely that either through the miracle of Tabitha that this man accepted the gospel or previously as the gospel was being spread in this region that these two men had a kinship and fellowship. That Peter, through the gospel, was living out this truth that our God is a way of life, makes outsiders insiders through faith in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that God desires to show saving grace to every race. And Peter demonstrates this by staying and fellowshipping with this man. I can't think as you leave here today and as you've heard about this faithful movement of God through the moving of his people, that God will begin to impress on your heart what he is telling you to move toward. Secondly, who he is telling you to move toward. And it may, by God's grace, be someone who doesn't look like you, doesn't talk like you, doesn't think like you. Be a Christ who is in you, is moving you towards this person to display the gospel. And as people of God, may God be unstoppable as we advance his gospel one opportunity at a time to whatever and to whoever he asks of us as we get moving for him. Would you close your eyes and bow your head? Our Father, we ask your blessing upon this time. And God, as we've heard this gospel, Lord, through the faithfulness of your people, God, may that ignite such faith in us. Father, may we get moving. May we place our yes on the table. May we be open doing, Lord, whatever and whoever. God, you've asked us to point and share Jesus with. God, we thank you, Lord, for the beauty and simplicity of this narrative. (laughs) We thank you for life change that is real. A man had a physical ailment that was healed. But God, there's a greater ailment, a spiritual ailment that you can heal through the Lord Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for Tabitha. Lord, how dynamic, charitable, how quick she was to do what it was you were asking her to do. Oh, God, how you used her faith. What an incredible impact. God, may you move mightily the same within us.